I want to talk to you about a high Renaissance architect. His name was Donato Bramante, and he was born in Urbino, but he worked in Milan and Rome, and we'll be looking at some things um, that he worked on in Rome. He was actually trained as a painter. And you'll find that some of these Renaissance artists are trained in one type of art, and they're able to move into another area. Uh, Brunelleschi was trained as a silversmith, and he becomes a great architect. Uh, Michelangelo is trained first as a painter, and then somewhat as a sculptor, and he also does architecture, and even uh, Raphael who is you know, very famous as a painter, uh, there is a, a building that he designed. Um, so Bramante today is known as sort of the epitome of high Renaissance architect. And we're going to look at this small building. Uh, you can see the scale from the people who are standing in front of it. Uh, this is a shrine uh, and it's known as the Tempietto, the little temple. Uh, it's next to the church of San Pietro in Montoro in Rome. And the site marks the spot where during the Renaissance, they believed that St. Peter was crucified. Now, it's probably not the right place. He probably was really crucified in the, in the Circus Maximus down at the bottom of the Avertine Hill. Um, but there was a record that said that he was crucified between the pyramids. And, you know, later people didn't quite know what that meant. So they found two pyramidal structures in Rome and sort of drew a line and halfway in between decided that was the spot. As it turns out, in modern times, they're excavating the Circus Maximus and they find the remains of two pyramidal constructions, which probably marked... Uh, you know, when you had a horse race, you had to go around these pyramids. You can't go cutting through the middle. Uh, and of course, uh, in the center would be where they would execute, uh, crucify criminals. Uh, and so that would probably have been where Peter was crucified. But this is where they believed it happened. And so this makes it a, a shrine to St. Peter, a, a kind of martyrium. Now, I want to talk to you a little about that name, the Little Temple. Um, you may remember we mentioned Alberti, who was both a humanist scholar and an architect. And when he wrote his book on architecture, he never called a church a, a church. He never called it ecclesia. Um, his seventh book or seventh chapter is on ecclesiastical structures, on religious buildings but it doesn't use the word ecclesia, which means church. And the reason is, is pretty simple. The word ecclesia would not have existed at the time of Cicero. Uh, the first century BC, and living a little bit into BCE, I guess, um, they didn't have churches, they had temples. And good classical Latin is considered to be the Latin of Cicero and his time. So as a humanist scholar, Bramante is trying to avoid medieval Latin and use this you know, good Ciceronian Latin. That's actually the Latin that they will teach you when you take Latin classes. Um, and so he uses the word for ecclesiastic, uh, he uses the word for religious building uh, which would be appropriate to that time, which is temple. And of course, this has so many classical elements that it does seem like a little temple, even though it is a shrine to a Christian saint. Uh, you can see that it is a round building. Uh, it has a centralized plan. It has a hemispheric dome, which you can see from the outside. Uh, and a Tuscan peristyle. Now, what does that mean? A uh, peristyle means the columns going around the perimeter. Uh, the Tuscan order is a classical order that essentially is the Doric order without fluting or without the vertical grooves that you usually see in the columns on classical temples. So this has a very simple capital 
um, it's a square rectangular shape and then the cylindrical shape uh, which would be the capital that you'd see with Doric uh, architecture uh, but instead of having the grooves vertically on the uh, columns it's it's very simple and so this was associated with uh, the Etruscans and uh, uh, it's called the Tuscan order there's a number of classical elements in this building. And it's that idea that we talked about with the Renaissance architect using classical elements in new ways. In this case, a shrine to St. Peter. Um, you can certainly see the hemispheric dome. In this case, we can tell it's a hemisphere from the outside as well as the inside. And uh, up on that upper story, and you see the shell motif in the uh, niches, that's a classical design. Uh, we have uh, a Tuscan peristyle, which I'll explain in a moment. And on the entablature, or the uh, horizontal member above it, uh, you see metopes and triglyphs. Don't worry, I'm not going to uh, uh, make you uh, memorize that. But those three grooves are called triglyphs, and the space between them are metopes. And they're part of the classical order uh, that's the Doric order. Well, the Tuscan order is very similar, except the columns do not have uh, those vertical grooves that we call fluting. So this would be a Tuscan peristyle. Uh, peristyle just means the columns are growing around the perimeter. And the Tuscan order is Doric, uh, the simplest of the classical orders, but does not have the fluting. The columns themselves are smooth. And uh, the Doric order is the very simple capital where you have a kind of um, square slab uh, and then down below it is a, sort of a cylindrical shape and uh, very, very simple. Um, if it were Doric, like the Parthenon, uh, you would have uh, the groove, the vertical grooves, the fluting, as they call it. Um, but uh, this is associated with Italy, uh, uh, maybe you say with very early times, like the Etruscans, and so it's called the, Etus the Tuscan order. As you can see, the plan of this building is circular. And I want to say a few words about the circle and the sphere as ideal shapes, which fit them very much into the Renaissance ideal of perfect harmony, perfect balance. Uh, you can see that a circle, for example, could certainly symbolize eternity, as it often did, uh, because it's never ending. It just keeps going round and round. There's no uh, end to it. Also, it's a perfect shape because, you know, every part of a circle or a sphere is equidistant from the center. Moreover, it represents the shape of the universe. Now, I know that some of you have heard this story that they tell to American school children that's absolutely false. Um, they like to tell us around Columbus Day uh, that Columbus was so brave because everybody thought the earth was flat and he would just sail right off the edge. Well, that's not true at all. I don't know if there were any peasants that thought the earth was flat, but as near as I can ascertain, the flat earth society is a relatively modern idea of kind of nutsy people. Um, since the time of the Greek philosopher Ptolemy, the universe was believed to be geocentric. It was believed to be spherical with the Earth, Geo, in the center. And the Earth was a sphere. And surrounding the Earth were celestial spheres, uh, transparent spheres, uh, in which were embedded the moon, the sun, and the five visible planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Of course, the planets that are further out, you need modern telescopes to find them. Uh, so they weren't known in classical times or the Renaissance. Beyond Saturn was the realm of the fixed stars. It was a sphere in which the stars were fixed, but did not seem to move. Uh, all of these other spheres rotated around the Earth. 
And out beyond that would be the Ethereum. That is where in uh, classical um, thought, the prime mover, that was a term used by Plato, uh, dwelt. And of course, for Christians, this is heaven. This is where God dwells, out beyond the realm of the fixed stars. So it may not be our modern conception of the universe, but it is a sphere, not flat. And you know this is confirmed uh, because if you look at images sometimes of an emperor or of Christ, uh, he often will be holding the globe of the universe. In the case of Christ or a Christian emperor, they may be surmounted by a cross. And you'll see these images you know, throughout uh, the Middle Ages. Um, now, the idea of Copernicus, that the sun was in the center, and he would have probably thought of it as the universe, but of uh, the solar system, uh, and the earth rotated around it, was published late in the 16th century, posthumously, um, after Copernicus's death. And then, of course, as you know, uh, there was a great deal of controversy about this uh, with Galileo and uh, other astronomers. Uh, they had very fine astronomers in the Renaissance, uh, in the 16th century and the 17th century. Um, their telescopes weren't uh, good enough to see some things that were very, very far out. Um, but in the early 17th century, for example, you have Kepler, uh, who comes up with the idea that the planets going around the sun have elliptical orbits. Now, I don't know how to account for it, but uh, one of the interesting things to me with that is how often ovoid shapes are used in the 17th century. And of course, these spherical shapes are used in the Renaissance. They're considered to be a, a perfect shape uh, representing uh, eternity, representing the universe. Now we want to look at a very famous design by Bramante uh, that was not built uh, exactly as he designed it. Uh, and this was Bramante's design for the Church of St. Peter's in the Vatican, San Pietro a Vaticano. Um, the original Church of St. Peter's in the Vatican was a fourth century church. It was a Constantinian foundation. In other words, Constantine, the first Christian emperor in the fourth century, whose mother was a Christian, St. Helena, uh, the Constantinian family gave the money to build the original very, very large church of St. Peter's on the spot where Peter uh, was believed to be buried. And that seems to be confirmed by the archaeological evidence. They've um, actually done archaeological um, um, excavations under St. Peter's, and they have gone down and found the early Christian uh, edicula that marks the grave of St. Peter. Um, so this was a fourth century church. And by the 16th century, it was old. Uh, and Pope Julius thought that, you know, this old church um, was just not worthy to be uh, the main church of Christendom, the one that the, it was very much associated with the papacy because, of course, uh, St. Peter's, um, St. Peter was the first bishop of Rome, the first pope. So Pope Julius assigned Bramante to design a new church of St. Peter's. And as you can see, here is the plan. And uh, the medal was struck uh, to uh, commemorate the design. So during the 16th century, uh, they were gradually tearing down old St. Peter's, the 4th century church, and building new St. Peter's, uh, the new church which was built in the 16th and 17th century. 
And the, the original church, uh, which was built over St. Peter's tomb, was the largest Christian church in the world from the 4th century to the 12th century, when in France, uh, a great monastery church uh, was built at Cluny, and it was also dedicated to St. Peter, St. Peter and Paul. And uh, for the next about four centuries. That was the largest church in the world. Uh, And then they built new St. Peter's and it was even larger. So it has gone back to being uh, the largest church, uh, largest Christian church in the world. Here you can see the medal that was struck to show the design by Bramante. And you can also see the plan. See it here. As you can see, he originally planned a huge dome on the top of the church, uh, kind of the Tempietto on steroids, this giant dome. Uh, and the dome shape was replete, re- and the dome shape was repeated uh, with uh, other domes, a little smaller ones, and half domes on the end of this cross. Uh, originally, two towers were planned. Um, They were never built. In the 17th century, uh, the artist Bernini uh, received a commission to do uh, the two towers, and I sometimes call them Bernini's only failure, because as they built them, they started to sink. Uh, The ground is too marshy for something with that concentrated weight of the towers, so they had to be torn down, and of course, uh, we do not have towers at uh, St. Peter's today. So you see all of these you know, classical motifs, and then you have uh, this very elegant plan. It is a centralized plan, essentially a square, with a Greek cross in the center. A Greek cross means that the arms of the cross are all the same le- same size. They're all the same length. Uh, and so it is you know, a perfectly centralized building. And then sort of uh, between the arms and the the edges of the square, you have other little Greek crosses, which would also be surmounted by domes. Um, It's a, as I say, it's a beautiful, elegant plan. Um, And maybe they start laying the foundations, but Bramante dies. And so Michelangelo is appointed to be the new designer of St. Peter's. So here we see the changing design of the Church of St. Peter's. Uh, Old St. Peter's uh, was essentially what we call a basilica church, um, and it's a longitudinal structure. It has uh, an apse, this rounded end, where you would place the high altar, and it has uh, small transepts, those are the cross arms, uh, it's, it's very, very large. As we said, it was the largest church in Christendom from the 4th to the 12th centuries. Uh, and it has these double side aisles and then an atrium or courtyard out front. During the 16th century, uh, first there was Bramante's design and they started to tear down St. Peter's. They didn't just tear the whole thing down and build the other uh, because, of course, they were still using the church. So they tear down parts and build up parts. Um, And there are drawings um, by people like Heimskirk and Hozart, uh, who are both um, Netherlandish artists who come down uh, to Italy and they do do some drawings of uh, uh, what's going on with these uh, ruins as they they pull down the old church and build up the new one. Um, When Bramante died, Michelangelo made some changes in the plan. And you can see that instead of uh, the little uh, cross arms within the large cross, he's changed that into a square ambulatory or a place to walk around. And then he's also decided to put on a facade. So it's still a Greek cross, it's still centralized under a great dome, and the, the dome uh, that exists today is Michelangelo's dome. Um, but now you can say, okay, this one side is the main entrance. It's got stairs and uh, uh, portico. Um, in the 17th century, they decided to make it even bigger, and they added, as you can see, three sections or three bays uh, 
on the west side, and then a um, facade, which is the one that exists today, and change this into a Latin cross. Uh, a Latin cross is when you have a long section, which is where a body would be hung on a, on a cross, and then the short arm section. Um, so you can see how uh, Bramante's plan influenced Michelangelo's plan, which was built and then, of course, added on to. And here we're looking at Michelangelo's Dome of St. Peter's. Um, you're seeing the mosaics inside, uh, and the outside uh, is, is quite interesting. Now, the lantern would have added uh, late in the century. This was not Michelangelo's design, but the dome itself is by Michelangelo. You can see that it is a ribbed dome. I can't help but think that Michelangelo was thinking of the great dome under which he was born, the dome of the Cathedral of Florence designed by Brunelleschi. But there are some very different things about it. It's, of course, it's not brick, it's stone. Um, but it looks like, almost like there's little eyes all the way around it in, in, uh, in a rose. Those actually are windows. And as you can see, he, uh, Michelangelo has alternated um, above the window, uh, there'll be a pediment, and then the next one there'll be a lunette, or there'll be a triangle, that's the pediment, and the lunette is the curving shape. Um, I think the purpose of that is to let light into uh, the shell of the dome. As you can see, they don't go all the way through. Uh, but if somebody had to get up there and, and do work on the um, you know, the construction of the dome or uh, repairs, uh, you know, they would, this would give them a little light to work by. And then down below, uh, you can see that you have columns, uh, two columns, uh, they call this dipterol, if you want a term, uh, and the entablature comes out where you have the columns and then goes in and then comes out and then goes in. And uh, you also have these windows, uh, which once again alternate the triangular pediment and the curving lunette. Uh, and you can see the inside, of course, of the windows uh, letting light into the building. As we said, um, in the 17th century, uh, Carlo Maderna uh, added three more bays, three more sections to the uh, Church of St. Peter, making it a longitudinal axis or a Latin cross plan. And so you can still see Bramante's and Michelangelo's design uh, being influential on the final version of the church, which is 17th century. And uh, there, of course, is St. Peter's as it stands today with Michelangelo's dome you know, above all. Uh, and here we're looking a little bit from the back as well. Uh, when you're looking out over Rome, you really do see this dome uh, you know, high up.